Okay, let's officially get started. Welcome everybody. We're excited to have you here today. Um, so there are three of us in this class today. My name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Constitution Center. I am here with Nicholas Mazvik and David Olson, turn on your camera for a minute if you don't mind. <laughs> Yeah, it will not it will not let me oh. says, okay well let's let's do a the host has stopped me but sorry, i yeah. that's that fine is, i'm here the host is yelling at you to do it so everybody so you know nick moskos is one of our senior scholars at the constitution center um, i'm here to kind of help moderate the questions of today and we're going to go through the 15 court cases that will be on the ap government test and we're here with david olson David Olson now should be able to turn on his camera and he is a teacher at Madison, Wisconsin. He teaches the AP test all the time. So David, you wanna say hi to everybody? Hello, welcome. I have been uh, very happy to work with the National Constitution Center for a number of years um, and I'm really excited we're doing this session. Um, I know we might have some students out there who are taking this exam in just a few weeks. We might have some who are taking it in a little over a month and we might have some who are taking it in like a month and a half. So wherever you are on this, all of this is stuff you need to know. So David is going to be in the Q&A. So every question students that you have around that AP exam, populate it in that Q&A and David's gonna answer that during the class. Nicholas and I are gonna walk through the big ideas and how these cases are grouped together. But any other kind of constitutional questions, feel free to put in the chat. That might be the easiest way to break it up. Um, but we're all here to help you. So we'll be jumping around like crazy people. And we have about 29 minutes to do this. So Nicholas, let's start with the first big grouping of cases. So when we look at the first two cases, we're looking at this big idea of federalism. And so when we think about what the AP test is going to be asking about what big idea they want their students to walk away with in these questions is what is federalism? And then how do these two court cases help define the concept of federalism? So uh, we need to understand how the judicial branch is also in part of this conversation and how the judicial branch itself defines federalism. So that is kind of the T up there, McCullough v. Maryland and United States v. Lopez, two bookend cases, one at the beginning of the constitution, oh, oh kinda, and one towards the end. So Nicholas, walk us through these cases, walk us through federalism, um, go, first section. Yes, and uh, you, we may even say that the, the court itself is part of federalism, which is to say when we're, we're talking about the structural constitution. And so when we, when we say that, we mean this division and allocation of power, both between the branches, which we call separation of powers, and then between the state and the national government which is always a reminder to us that uh, before the constitution was signed and then ratified, there were state constitutions and there were state governments. And it's those states that had ratifying conventions for the people to ratify the constitution, right? So that's an important concept of why this division matters so much and why we fought over it for so long. And when I said the courts, what I meant is state courts existed too before. And so part of that allocation of power in federalism is the division of power between the state judiciary and the state courts, and then the federal courts, which is something that changes over time. And it's a rather important battle during the 19th century. You don't need to know all the details just to say is the courts themselves are part of this too. And when we get to um, uh, the end and we talk about Marbury versus Madison, well, it's why that's a controversial case over time to the extent that the Supreme Court has the power to make some of these decisions in the first place. So it's all that big picture of what federalism is, where these disputes come from, and why they're so central to the constitutional order and to our history over the entire 233 years or what, 34 now that we've had the or close to it that we've had the Constitution. So Oh, no, I'm sorry. Wait, the ratification will be 233 years in June because it's my birthday. Nice. So, okay. um, but yes, <laughs> Thank goodness you have we'll that get... date so we can remember. Well, that. yeah, it actually is helpful for the ratification. <laughs> so but McCulloch is coming yeah. out of this, one of these big issues. We like to do this thing where we say like, we're, all we remind ourselves is after the ratification, they have to figure out what the constitution means. 
<laughs> right? They have to have these debates. Now, now they have a government. Okay, what does that look like? What are the big issues? What does the Constitution mean? Well, one of the first huge constitutional issues is the debate over the National Bank. And it's between Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. And the outcome of that debate in 1791 is uh, Hamilton wins because this famous dinner deal is made and struck so that Hamilton gets his financial deal and his, his national bank and uh, the capital will be in uh, the District of Columbia in between New York and um, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but Madison had said, well, the bank was unconstitutional because there's no power in Article One for Congress to create and charter a national bank, right? Because chartering in corporations and banks is something states did. It's not something the national government could do. That debate did not entirely go away, right? So it gets chartered for 16 years. It gets chartered again in 1817, and it's President Madison himself, when he's about to leave office, who who signs that bill. And um, But this debate is still very much alive. And Maryland, the state, reacts to this second chartering of the National Bank uh, by trying to tax the National Bank. They say, we're going to tax it out of existence within our state because we don't think that the national government has a right or a power to do this. Um, under our idea of federalism. Uh, it's Chief Justice John Marshall who writes the opinion in McCulloch. And the two big takeaways here are supremacy clause and then necessary and proper clause. Okay, so supremacy clause, what I mean is essentially the idea that if the national government acts, national law is supreme over state law. So it trumps it, right? So state's creation doesn't matter here because that national government has acted, it's created this national bank, therefore it has power of taken. Okay, necessary and proper, what do we mean by that? Well, I mean, okay, what Marshall is saying is that what the necessary and proper clause means is that Congress gets to choose the means by which it carries out its enumerated powers. So yes, it has limited powers, but those powers that it is given by the text of the Constitution in Article I it chooses how it can carry them out. And as long as it doesn't choose means which are improper, right, Be which would violate Nesser and proper, then it's fine. Then the Supreme Court is not going to um, question the choices that they make, right? So in other words, creating a national bank was Congress's choice of how to carry out its given powers over the national economy. And the, therefore, that's what made it constitutional, and the supremacy clause means it's supreme over the state. McCulloch still matters, though. I mean, this is our big thing. With the theme we've been harking on is that McCulloch never goes away. And so what we're debating ever since then is how, what are the limits, if any, on Congress's powers to regulate the economy? And that's a huge federalism question, right? What are the limits between that the federal and state powers. And so that Lopez, takes us to Lopez. I was going to say, yeah. and Lopez kind of starts to define yes. there are some limits. It's not unlimited um, under the necessary and proper and supremacy clause. I don't so, know how you put it last time, but you put it, it's like there's degrees in this. Like, look, it, this is about a line of demarcation. It's, 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 it's setting some sort of upward bound or limit because in the 1930s and 1940s, the Supreme Court, there's a famous case, Wickard versus Filborn on the 1942, which basically says, okay, even a farmer's wheat yeah. growing for themselves to be consumed on their farm can be reached under the Commerce Clause. And what Lopez is saying is, okay, we're not going to overrule those previous cases. We're not questioning those cases. What we're doing is saying there has to be some sort of limit because we think McCullough didn't mean to say Congress has unlimited choices. And so here it's about this gun-free school zones act. And what the court says is, okay, the problem is Congress wasn't even trying to make a connection between some sort of economic activity that's related to interstate commerce, right? They didn't even do the wicked thing of just even articulate a connection between market, the 
interstate market or economic activity. None was done here. And that suggests that Congress was asserting power over all economic activity. And that couldn't have been what McCulloch meant. So there's some sort of limit on what Congress can do. Yeah. So if we think about like McCulloch setting a, like a, here's the bottom line that everything yes. above it, um, this does put a, like a threshold. Exactly. On the exactly. There's be somewhere in between. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way of thinking about it. Right. There's an upward bound, but there's also a minimum. Right. Which and, a lot of these cases, and that's why they picked them together, we're trying to show where where the boundaries are yep. between the two. Um, so a question in here, has, has Lopez been cited in connection to the state education plans um, around teachers? Um, that might be a better question for the Second Amendment class we're doing yes. in a couple of weeks, um, but not yet. I don't right? think, I mean, my answer to that would, I, I don't think they would cite Lopez because Lopez has yeah. to do with what Congress can do. And your question has to do with what states and local governments can do, which has something to do with more like something like um, uh, it's it's a harder question because it's the it, it tends to be more about what can states do if Congress hasn't acted, which is what we call the dormant commerce clause. Mm. That's a fancy term, but that just simply means there's this small intersection. We're doing this, you know, this graph again. What happens if the state acts and Congress hasn't specifically acted? And is there, what is this piece that state can do themselves? What, is there also power Congress holds even if it doesn't act, right? And yeah. that intersection, that's hard. It's a, it's a small, particular place, but that, and that has to do with state police powers, that <laughs> regulatory authority that states has. Yes, and, I, yeah. And how and that so intersects with the Bill of Rights. And so, yeah, there's some complex um, questions there. And it's to say is, I don't, I don't think Congress has said that states can't allow teachers to carry weapons. Yeah. So, and so there's this, no existing con congressional scheme. So now there's state questions and there's even state constitutions and the state uh, courts themselves will have to interpret, for instance, whether or not there's a violation, not only of the second amendment, right, but their own constitutions, which is to say, that's a hard question. And also to say, don't worry, students, this will not be on we the will, AP test. It will not be on the AP <laughs> exam. And we Lopez. have a separate we have a separate Second Amendment class we're going to do where we can definitely uh, talk about that. And yes, David, breathe easy. The Dormer <laughs> Commerce Clause is a question that bedevils law students. So please do will not worry not about that for AP. the AP exam. Okay. So I'm Nicholas, just giving you that me, graph yeah, and we're going to use it in the same thing here for the Bill of Rights and Liberty and Order, because if we replace state and federal power and the extent of commerce or Congress's power with liberty and order, let's do the same thing because we're talking about these boundaries and in the places in which they both intersect and sometimes compete, which yeah. is the theme Curry's been giving here is it's not like they always clash, but they do clash sometimes. We're, so we're trying to create a balance between the two. Okay, let's pause for a second. Let's set this up for the students. So students, this next section of cases that you're looking in is just what Nicholas was saying there, but it's looking at the Bill of Rights. So when we think about the freedom to be, the freedom to have liberty, when we look at Jefferson's writing in the Declaration of Independence, we're constantly looking at the setup between what rights you have and what rights you give over to the government to keep you safe, to keep you protected, to keep you a part of this unit. So we look at those words and we talk about unalienable rights like life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that governments are created to secure and institute among men, derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. So what it sometimes feels like is that liberty or, you know, or freedom in some ways can be at odds with individual rights. And what we want to set, look at these five cases that were picked is sometimes they're maybe, Nicholas said this earlier and I loved it, they're more like rubbing each other. Don't think of them as clashing, but more that like rubbing and having some frictions and uh, past each other. So the four cases are going to look at that balance between government power and individual rights. It's Engel v. Vitao and Wisconsin v. Yoder. Let's start with those two because those two kind of go over the same constitutional concept. And then we'll dive into Tinker um, and how that's connected. So Nicholas, set up for us Engel v. Vitao and Wisconsin v. Yoder. What are, what's the real crops of the intersection of these two cases? Yeah, and we'll, following off of what David put in the chat, so we're talking about 
the First Amendment, but specifically religious freedom. And in Engel, we're talking about the Establishment Clause. And in Yoder, we're talking about free exercise of religion. So we're talking about the, the two pieces of religious liberty we talk about under the First Amendment. And the government's doing different things in these cases, right? So in Engel, what the government is doing, this is New York State was saying that public schools um, could have in the morning announcement, a very brief non-denominational prayer. So that would be part of public school. And the court there said, um, no, that would be an endorsement of a religious message that would conflict with the mission of government public schools. So I always point that out and we've been talking about it and it's because context matters and what the government's goals matter, right? Like it's just the question of what is the government trying to do, right? Here it's saying that, okay, if the state tries to do that, it's conflicting with the educational mission and it's a, therefore it's a religious liberty problem um, because it gives this message to public school children um, the content of which is re- is too religious in character against the educational mission. I think Curry put it in an earlier cl- class that it's, it's, well, education mission is what conflicts here, right? So think of it that way. When and we go is, to- When you talk oh, sorry, about go government, ahead. school, government, who's the yep. government in this setting? It's the public school. Awesome. So right, just right? want to like- And the officials, her. right? Yep. And that's why we go forward and we see more of these cases where we add um, you know, that the Supreme Court says that counts too for if it was prayer before a graduation ceremony, even if it's non-denominational before a high school football game, or even if it's silent, all of those would still conflict with this educational mission. And we've been talking about how the court treats that different, both in terms of what the government's trying to do in the history of it, for purposes of things like town meetings and a non-denominational prayer before them, that those are different from that school context. And we have to keep that in mind because the con- the conflict we're talking about, the rub is different. Yeah. And so Yoder is like that too, right? I said that this is more about free exercise religion. And here it's this parental right and this religious freedom going up against compulsory education by which we mean that the state can generally um, uh, punish people who don't keep their children in s- some sort of education uh, school, right? Um, so compulsory meaning that you can fine or otherwise punish people who who try to take their children out of uh, uh, out of school. And here, this was Amish parents in Wisconsin who were saying that their 13 year olds could now be removed from. Uh, the public school system so that they could return home to work and be part of um, their deeply held religious values, which had to do with family and work. And the Supreme Court said, yes, in that case, that has to do with both religious freedom and sort of this other general liberty of parents to sort of make these educational choices. And I think what's fascinating about this one, it's so, so it's compel- they are compelled to send their students, kids to school until eighth grade. Yes. But after eighth grade, then it's the parents role to say, these are our moral values and we're going to teach it. That's where free exercise comes in. And you, you just pointed that out too, right? Which is to say is you pointed out the very specific facts of this, right? It's pretty, it's specific, right? It's yeah. even eighth grade itself, right? Is, which suggests it may have been different if they tried to take out a 10 year old and yeah. we don't know, right? But that may have been different. So when we think about Tinker, it's still in a public school setting, but yep. we're talking about free speech. Yep. So uh, tell us a Different little bit. Different First about, Amendment value, right? Yeah, but we're, still. We keep shifting. Yeah, but political speech. And it, so yep. it's no longer religious speech. It's political speech. It's symbolic speech. Tell us about this case. Yeah, so it's the armband case. And that's I like this image because it's always helpful because it's it tells us exactly what we're talking about, which is these students are purposely wearing these uh peace symbol armbands. It's during the Vietnam War. So it's clearly conveying this message of opposition to the war. And we've been talking about this as to say, um, 
the concern of school officials was this could lead to violence and fights. And, uh, you know, when they said this could interfere with discipline and order, it was, this is a very contentious time. This is the big political issue of the day. And so if students come in and even if they were in our band, that could, that could really cause problems at school. And the Supreme Court was saying, no, they have a right to that symbolic speech. It's not clear that would be disruptive. Um, uh, in that you don't lose your bill of rights in the school setting, but then it also, it sets up this test going forward. And this is what we've been harping on is that yes, in Tinker, it's okay. That symbolic speech is okay. But the question the court asks going forward is the school setting is different. And therefore, if a different symbolic speech or political speech does in fact, um, do something to sufficiently um, uh, undermine the order and uh, educational mission of the public school, then the school officials can actually restrict that speech in a way they couldn't if it was just the general public, right? Where we really protect a lot of speech. So let's talk about protection of speech in the general public or really press. Um, And how much we protect it, right? Exactly. How much we protect it. This is a general public setting. It's New York Times um, and it's the press. And what I find so fascinating about this is this idea of prior restraint. And can the government stop a newspaper from printing materials before they print it because it could have secrets in it for the government? So this is a pretty fascinating case. Uh, yeah, it is. And it comes out of the what we call the Pentagon Papers, which is it's Vietnam War. And in 1967, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara commissioned the secret study of 22 years in Vietnam. He was growing to uh, against the war, but had not left the administration. So he commissioned the secret study. And there was over 4000 pages of this of, uh, of this study that included a lot of government secrets. Uh, very sensitive things like involvement in the assassination of South Vietnam's leader, Ngo Diem. Um, and uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who was an uh, analyst at Rand Corporation, him, him and an associate photocopied all 4,000 plus pages of this report. And in February 1971, he, he sent it to a New York Times reporter. And by June, the New York Times started printing parts of these papers. And uh, the Nixon administration sued under the Espionage Act in 1917. So they restrained the New York Times from printing. But then the Washington Post got the Pentagon Papers. Then 15 other papers got it. And even the Senate um, started printing and um, putting into the official record portions of these papers. And that took us to the Supreme Court because very quickly it got to the Supreme Court because this was becoming a public crisis, right, of whether or not the government could restrain the printing of these these secrets. And the court says, no, the government needs a really good reason if it's going to restrain the publishing of even government secrets, because prior restraint in and of itself, which is government trying to stop the publication of anything, right, whether it's newspaper or a book or anything, is historically one of the reasons for having freedom of press, going back to John Milton and his complaints about English licensing in the 1640s, right? Is that this is this is the heart of freedom of the press. Just think of it that way, right? Is that what that what we're talking about? Is it should be very hard for the government to be able to prove that it can restrain things. But yes, the opposite is Shank which Perfect. is uh, what we call the clear and danger test. This is World War I. The Espionage Act I just mentioned, here it is again. And this is uh, part of the limitations passed by the Wilson administration on the First Amendment during World War I. And the Supreme Court upholds the prosecution under the Espionage Act here for disseminating pamphlets, um, criticizing the national draft and telling people how to avoid it. And the Supreme Court says, well, there's a clear and present danger to the national security that would interfere with the war effort. Um, The First Amendment is, in fact, more limited in that that set of circumstances. Um, We keep noting this and we have to say this, which is 
Within 50 years, the Supreme Court has moved away from this towards what we call the imminent standard of Brandenburg versus Ohio, which is even more protective of free speech, um, even when it seems to be dangerous um, or uh, uh, dangerous speech. Yeah, and I um, I do appreciate David Olson pointing out, but if there is a fire, you can totally yell fire in a crowded theater. Yes, you cannot uh, falsely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's the most one. Of, it's perhaps the most misunderstood and misused quote in Supreme Court history. <laughs> um, because um, yes, so we won't be taking T-shirts with that. But the next yes. is one of my favorite topics: incorporation. So we think mm. about how the Bill of Rights are applied to the individual through the states we're thinking of incorporation and the the AP exam looks at these three cases. So Gideon, Roe and McDonald. So Nick, we're running real short on time. So walk us through the big ideas of incorporation and then we'll fly through these cases real quick. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's, I think what we said last time, we'll do yeah. it again here, which is that these three cases, keep in mind, we could do 10 or 20 other cases, which is say incorporation is piece by piece applying parts of the Bill of Rights to the states, that is to say state interference against those, those civil rights and those liberties, right? And, um, and so here we're talking about the Sixth Amendment right, the Second Amendment right, and then Roe versus Wade isn't a specific Bill of Right. It, it's the right of privacy applied nationally. So uh, Gideon has to do with the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. So my point here is to say, when we talk about incorporation, we're not talking about the whole amendment, but parts of the amendment, right? So that could be the Fifth Amendment, uh, you know, uh, right uh, against self-incrimination. Here it's about Sixth Amendment and the right to counsel. And it says both that that applies to the state, and that it means that states have to provide for assistance of counsel for indigent defendants, that is defendants who are too poor to afford assistance of counsel like Mr. Gideon. So that does two things there. As I said with Roe, it has to do with the right to privacy, which goes back to the 1965 case of Griswold versus Connecticut, which has to do with limitations on contraceptions in the state of Connecticut. And so it's an expansion of the right to privacy, as Curry put it in the chat, um, which overrules state laws dealing with abortion and sets up uh, um, sets the test going forward, which is later altered by the Supreme Court in 1992. All that to say is that the right of privacy is something that the Supreme Court finds within the Bill of Rights, but not a specific part of the Bill of Rights. So it's a little confusing. It's easier to talk about McDonald yep. and Gideon because it's about specific parts of the text. McDonald is taking District of Columbia versus Heller that 2008 case that found that there was a right to own a handgun within the home, an individual right, and it's applying it to the states. So it's taking that piece from 2008, it's applying it now to the states. So it also means it applies to the Chicago law. Um, I said this earlier, I think the one last note about incorporation you can get out of McDonald is they're asking this question is whether or not this specific part of the Bill of Rights is fundamental and it looks at the history and the text to see if it should be applied to the states, which is why not every part of the Bill of Rights is applied to the states yet. The court is still going through piece by piece. Most of the Bill of Rights are applied to states, just not all of them. I think that's a great point to take away too. What are the fundamental rights? And they will be the ones that are incorporated, you know, yes. given to the individuals to be protected by the states. Now, this yes. next grouping looks at the 14th Amendment. It looks at the citizenship clause, the due process clause, the equality clause in these two big cases. So Brown versus Board of Ed um, that I'm sure our students know a lot about, but we'll go over really quickly. And then Citizens United. And Nicholas, like, can you connect the dots for me between these two cases and the 14th Amendment? Why were they chosen as examples of this idea of the 14th Amendment and then kind of maybe using the 14th Amendment for incorporation with Citizens United? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard I know. Um, because Citizens United is mostly a First Amendment case and not really primarily about the 14th Amendment. Uh, Brown is, is easier because we are talking about equal protection directly in the sense that equal protection means separate but equal 
is unconstitutional because it's inherently unequal because it creates classes between citizens. I was saying this earlier, I think that's a good way of thinking about it is the Supreme Court saying that's not okay in public schooling because in fact they are inherently unequal programs and then therefore uh, we have to desegregate the schools, right? And so at the heart of it is this principle about what equality means in the sense that it doesn't allow for those types of classifications that separate but equal had. Um, Citizens United is yeah, comes to a dispute about uh, election law and this notion that um, uh, nonprofits, labor unions, and corporations we're talking about could not um, put out political speech too close to an election. In this case, it was a documentary about Hillary Clinton. And the Supreme Court uh, said, no, that part of the um, uh, bipartisan campaign reform act was struck down because it violated the first amendment um, because uh, political speech broadly was not affected if, if it was done by people coming together in order to, um, uh, to speak is one, right? Which is what nonprofits, corporations, and labor unions do generally, um, with these, uh, types of ads or political speech. So again, we're talking about political speech. It's connection to equality is hard. Um, mm. frankly, uh, I, I think because primarily Citizens United is focused on, um, the first amendment itself and this notion of political speech affecting groups of people. So I think that, think yeah, of it yeah. that way is an important thing is that a communication is a type of speech and it's done is a group of people, right? Um, and, and so- And one is unfairly given more um, leeway that it wouldn't be equal. Um, okay. Yes, exactly. Next- because even, because yeah. how are you gonna treat labor unions and nonprofits and other companies differently is the problem, right? Is it's something like that. There are groups of people coming together to speak and that's the larger principle. So think of it almost like association. The yeah. part of the first amendment we didn't talk about, but keep that in mind there. It's, so the equality is between groups of people. And that's probably the best way I think, Curry, you're right to, to group to, them, to try to group them, even though free uh, political speech seems so different from public education. So the next kind of grouping, which I find really interesting, is Baker yes. v. Carr and Shaw v. Reno. And so it looks of a quality of representation. So in one way, ensuring that each person has like one vote, uh, one person, one vote. And yep. then Shaw v. Reno is about gerrymandering and it's around gerrymandering based on race. Yes. And so I, what I love about these, and I think this is what you like have shared with us in the past is it's these cases really open the door to more cases and more dialogue. And they, these are really hot button issues still today. So can you walk yes. us through these two cases real fast? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what we said about Baker is that, you know, Baker has to do with Tennessee. Basically, they didn't redistrict for 60 years, even though their constitution, their state constitution said they had to every 10 years. And so there was a suit over this saying it was a 14th Amendment equal protection violation. What the court was saying in this case was we will open the doors. Federal courts need to take these cases. So they, it's not about deciding on the merits here. It's about even opening the door because previously the court had said those kinds of cases are political questions that we don't decide because they're about states making these essential decisions. Think federalism again, right? That's, that's federalism creeping in again and saying that, well, states get to decide how they draw their political lines and we don't really get into that. And the Supreme Court here is saying, no, when it's going to cause that much inequality between the right to vote within states and in the nation, uh, nationally broadly, we have to in order to assert the equal protection under the Fourteenth Amendment. So it's the one person, one vote principle. It's there's several cases that follow up in 1963 and 1964 that really assert that because now the door is open, so they can take them. And then Shaw versus Reno is just asking this other question that's I I think it's just really hard, right? Is okay. So what if after all that happens? 
a state draws, and you pointed this out this morning, and I think it was great. It was like, if you look at some of these shapes and you're like, what if you draw this really weird shape in gerrymandering in order to create what's called a minority majority district, meaning it would be blacks are the minority in the state, but within this district, they're the majority and therefore they get political power within that district. Is that an equal protection violation? And that's a really hard question. And Shaw versus Reno shows that, and it's true going forward, right? As in, in this instance, the court narrowly overruled that under the Equal Protection Clause. But I think if you read the decision, it shows that it's a really hard question because it's not that the court's saying that desire to do so is necessarily in and of itself the problem, but it might be that the district itself, the way it's drawn, the way it's done on the basis of race could be an equal production violation. So, and again, David pointed out to the students and I loved it, make sure you're referencing the equal protection yes. clause, not just the 14th amendment. Yep. That 14th amendment is big. They it need is. to know what section you, you're referencing. So thank you for all being constitutional scholars. And last but not least, and what the I love one. about- <laughs> Yeah, the big one. And I think this is, it brings it, you said this earlier and I loved it. It brings us back to the beginning, brings us back to the checks and balances, separation of powers, roles of the judiciary, and, you know, federalism across, spread across the national, um, national government. So federalism isn't just, you know, national government, state government, local governments. It's also across the government, too. And I'll just use my Neapolitan parfait analogy and turn it back to you, Nicholas. Yeah, well, and even Baker versus Carr, we just talked about, goes into this, right? Because I said previously, the court said, well, that's a political issue. That's going to the role of judiciary and saying, previously, the Supreme Court said, well, it's not the court's job to get involved in gerrymandering and how the states draw their lines and how they do redistricting, right? That's a question about the role of judiciary. We're often talking about that here in the background, right, is when the court asserts itself. And Murray versus Madison is really, it's about... Chief Justice John Marshall using this particular case to define the role and power of not only the Supreme Court, but the federal judiciary generally, right? It's, he's definitely talking about the Supreme Court, but he's, he's talking more broadly. And I think we talked about this, Curry, that is that it, it is an opportunity, right? Yes, we can get into the specifics of the case of the election of 1800 and uh, all the madness going around the fact that John Marshall was briefly Secretary of State and Chief Justice. Um, but the bottom line is that in overruling part of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which is what he does, John Marshall is also laying out why the court has the power of judicial review, why it's specifically their role and duty to answer and resolve fundamental constitutional questions. And I think that's really the important of Marbury. And that's why we still talk about and debate it. It's like McCulloch the same way, right? As it sets this blueprint, but that discussion continues. And then the way of writing Supreme Court cases, we also talked about this too, right? Is it's the Supreme Court cases is a vehicle for discussing uh, how we even view right, the role of government and our own political theory and constitutional theory, the big questions are going to be in there too. And Marshall does that for us. And I think that's why uh, Marbury is, it still is something we have to talk about. It's judicial review and even judicial supremacy, which is to say is, is the Supreme Court also the final role, um, final Word. voice, an authoritative voice in making these decisions? Those are all crucial questions that even though we think of Marbury as resolving it, we still, of course, ask about them ourselves because it sets up the question going forward, too, because Marshall does such a good job of telling us what the stakes are. Yep. And I think it's really important. And remember to look at the when you're answering these questions on your AP test, what is judicial review? What is judicial supremacy? And then ask those questions Nicholas was just spelling out. Do, does this shift the balance of powers? Do, does Marshall in this court case helping to define what the, the what the courts are, helping kind of beef up that Article Three? Does that shift the power? Um, how are these this connected to lifetime um, appointments as well? And so think of all those things 
But this has been a independence is in Federalist 78, by the way, because I know Davis put that up. But that's the same thing, right, is that not only is Hamilton talking about role and power and all that, he's also talking about independence and why that's connected, why those things are important. So, yes, the more you can put those elements together, the better your answers are going to be. And Great Valley School just shared this also relates to the debate over judicial restraint and judicial activism. So students, you have so many great tools to pick from from here. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Join us again during the week, but we also want to wish you good luck. Remember, get good sleep, eat something, and breathe before you take that test. Oxygen will help you, and you're going to be awesome. Um, And so you know the content, and that's what matters in the long run, but we really appreciate you trying to make sure you get all the answers right, too. So thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, David Olson, for being the teacher support in in here as well. And students, if you need anything, feel free to reach out. You all have my email. Shoot me an email, and I'll make sure one of us gets back to you with some supporting tools. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Good job. All right, thanks. (laughs) A lot to go through.